Chapter 5, Section 2. This is about the structure and diversity of prokaryotes. When you compare a prokaryotic cell to a eukaryotic cell, the prokaryotes are structurally simple, but they're quite diverse, and that's something we're going to come back to. Prokaryotes lack a cell nucleus, an area where they contain all of their DNA surrounded by a membrane. But what they do have is a nucleoid region, and inside that nucleoid region, you can find all of the DNA for a bacteria cell. And also the bacteria has about 10 times less uh, DNA than you would find in a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes also have a flagella. That's a long tail, and you can see it on the bacteria to your right, and that helps them move through their environment. They also have another structure called the fimbri, and the fimbri allow these bacteria to attach to different surfaces. And in fact, it's these fimbri that can make bacteria very difficult to get rid of. I didn't spend a lot of time going over the structure of a bacteria cell. What I'm really more interested in talking about is why we don't consider them to be primitive, even though they're simple compared to a eukaryotic cell. The reason why they're not necessarily primitive is because they're incredibly diverse. And the reason why is bacteria evolve rapidly. When you think about a generation time of 20 minutes, that's fast. Humans are almost 20 years. As a result, bacteria have evolved to live almost anywhere on this planet, and they've evolved many different types of metabolic pathways. So for example, plants did not evolve photosynthesis. It was actually bacteria that did it. Bacteria evolved photosynthesis over 3.5 billion years ago. And if you're not familiar with photosynthesis, it's where these bacteria called cyanobacteria take in carbon dioxide and water and they use the energy and sunlight to make carbohydrates and oxygen. And as you can imagine, that oxygen had large consequences for life living on this planet. This picture to your right is a spirogyra. It's not actually a cyanobacteria, but it looks a little similar to it, at least superficially. What is interesting is that cyanobacteria evolved photosynthesis. Plants didn't. What you're looking at are plant cells specifically from an aquatic plant called Elodea. And those green things moving around are the chloroplast. And the origins of chloroplast were once free living bacteria called cyanobacteria that did evolve photosynthesis. And we're gonna talk more about that in the next section. Bacteria and archaeans, which are both prokaryotes, can live in a crazy range of environments. And in fact, they can live in very, very cold environments and about 20 years ago, scientists went down to Antarctica and they were looking at the rocks down there and they discovered bacteria living in the rocks, literally gaining their electrons from the minerals inside the rock. That's astounding. These bacteria, we don't even know how long they could live, but they may live for hundreds or thousands of years. And some people have speculated even longer than that. So when we talk about things living in extreme environments, we call them extremophiles. And this is an example of a very cold environment, and on Earth, we have bacteria living there. At the other end of extreme, prokaryotes can live in very hot environments. In the 1970s, they thought that you wouldn't find life living in much more than 130, 140 degree water. Well, they were wrong. They found Thermus aquaticus living in Yellowstone at over 160 degrees. And we've been to hot vents down in the bottom of the ocean where we found bacteria and archaea, two types of prokaryotes, living in water that's over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. That's almost hot enough to boil water in. Bacteria can also live in very acidic environments as well, things with a very low pH. We're talking pH of 1 or 2. Guess what? There are bacteria that can live there. And in fact, many of you may remember when the Animus River got polluted last year and it turned a bright orange. That was from acid mine drainage. This is the El Compagre River in Colorado, and it constantly has acid mine drainage. And it's the bacteria living in there that are extracting the electrons or energy from the rocks. They're turning the water bright orange. Bacteria can also live in very alkaline environments and very salty environments as well. So if you ever heard of the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake, there may not be any fish living there, but
but there are definitely bacteria and archaeans living in those extreme environments. Unfortunately, some bacteria are harmful to us, like Clostridium tetani. This causes tetanus. You get a shot against tetanus, and tetanus is a disease that can kill you because it will make every muscle in your body contract at the same time and uncontrollably. Not a good way to go. However, we've discovered that in the last decade, bacteria are way more numerous than we ever thought. Not only are they way more numerous, they are way more diverse, and they are everywhere. And we've also realized that our microbiome, our microbiome are all the different microbiota that live on us, all the bacteria and fungus and archaeans and protists that live with us. It's diverse. And we're also finding out that it's very beneficial to us as well. This image right here is showing the different types of bacteria that live on the surface of your body. Within the last decade, with the advent of new technologies for sequencing DNA, we've discovered that the diversity of microbes living inside of our gut is incredibly diverse. We've always known that there's been lots of E. coli, in fact, E. coli by the trillions. But now that we can sequence DNA in very small amounts, we've discovered that the average person has perhaps up to a thousand different types of bacteria living in their gut. The question is, what are they doing inside of our gut? How are they helping us? How are they harming us? It turns out that most of them are helpful. We've also realized that people with a more diverse gut microbiome tend to be healthier. They're not as obese. They don't have diabetes. Those people also tend to exercise and eat more, as, eat more healthily as well. So there's a lot of studies coming out right now trying to understand what's the role of our diet, what's the role of our genetics, and the rest of our environment on our gut microbiome and how that affects our health.